Tēnā koutou katoa, anyong haseyo, and to our Korean uh, guests, and a very warm good afternoon to everyone. My name's Rob Ravel. I'm the professorial fellow at the Centre of Strategic Studies here at Victoria University of Wellington. Today I'm wearing two hats. I'm also vice president of the New Zealand Institute of International Affairs. And it's a real pleasure wearing both hats to welcome you all, excellencies, distinguished guests. We have a, a very distinguished audience with us here today, so I'm delighted that so many of you have been able to make it this, after, this afternoon. One of the great um, advantages that we have here in Wellington City is that we have a very rich ecosystem of security and international affairs. And it's a particular pleasure for the CSS to be cooperating with the NZIIA today. But there are members and representatives here of many other organisations that are part of that ecosystem. A number of government agencies uh, are represented here today, from MFAT to NZDF to the Ministry of Defence and others. A number of organisations that operate in this space, such as the Asia New Zealand Foundation, are represented here today. And of course, we have a number of ambassadors with us here today and other representatives of the diplomatic missions who we interact with so regularly within that ecosystem that, uh, that I mentioned. And I, I would be um, remiss if I didn't mention the various members of the academic community who are here today as well, both academic staff and, of course, most importantly of all, the most important people in the room, students. And can I also welcome uh, the wider representatives of civil society who are here with us today and are also a crucial part of, of that ecosystem. As you all know, we're here today to look at one of the most intractable issues in, Asia, in the Asia-Pacific region in, uh, in today's world, and that is the North Korean nuclear issue. The question we're posing, is a diplomatic solution possible? Is something that people around the region are, res are uh, rap uh, grappling with and wrestling with uh, and have been doing so for some time? We're very fortunate that we have a very uh, a very distinguished and expert panel to address these issues. Some of you may have attended an earlier event uh, a couple of months ago or so, which featured the four ambassadors from the Republic of Korea, from Japan, from the United States, and from China, which was an NZIIA event. And we had the opportunity there to hear about the official positions of those countries. Today we're going to have a complimentary session, which brings in some people who are real experts, as well as hearing the voice of the New Zealand government on this particular issue as well. What we're going to do in the session is we're going to have each of our speakers speak for about 15 minutes. I will introduce introduce each of them individually, and then we will follow that with a panel uh, discussion opportunity where we can have Q&A, and I'll have all the speakers up here at the table, and you can grill them uh, uh, at, that, at that time. But we'll reserve all the questions for once all of them have spoken. Uh, can I, though, begin by inviting the Ambassador of the Republic of Korea to come up to the podium first. It's thanks to the ambassador that we have um, one, of our, one of our key speakers here today, Professor Yoon Yoon Kwan, who, uh, who I will introduce shortly. But it's thanks to the generosity of the Korean government that we are able to have him as part of the panel. And as a result, I would like to ask the ambassador to uh, make a few opening remarks uh, that uh, will introduce this panel this panel discussion. The ambassador, Ambassador Yeo Seung Bai, is someone who is himself very equipped to speak on this topic, and he has done so recently, as I mentioned, at that NZIIA event. The ambassador was educated at Seoul National University in Korea and also at the University of Virginia in, in the USA. He has had extensive diplomatic experience and has served his country um, in many parts of the world, from the United States, Senegal, uh, China, Norway, Afghanistan, 
And during his career, he has also uh, been uh, tasked with leading the North Korean Nuclear Bureau in the Office of Korean Peninsula Peace and Security Affairs. And he has also served as Deputy Director General for the Office of Co Korean Peninsula Peace and Security Affairs, as well as leading the North American uh, Division in, in his ministry. So can I please invite Ambassador Yeo to open the proceedings for us? Can you join me in welcoming him? Thank you, Rob, uh, for your generous introduction. But uh, uh, I, I know I am not uh, the hero of today. So uh, I do not uh, make any former uh, speech, but to say a few words. Um, the uh, members of uh, diplomatic corps and uh, uh, opinion leaders, distinguished guests and ladies and gentlemen, I really thank you all of you for uh, joining us today. Um, I uh, really appreciate uh, the Center for Strategic uh, Studies and uh, NZ Institute of International Affairs and New Zealand uh, Foreign Ministry and Trade for helping us uh, have uh, today's seminar on the Korean uh, Peninsula. Um, today is uh, the North Korean nuclear issue is not only uh, our issue, Korean issue, but also becoming the global and the regional uh, severe uh, security threat. So with the growing threat uh, from North Korea and uh, accordingly the growing concerns and uh, interest uh, among uh, New Zealanders over this issue, I think it is uh, very timely and appropriate to have uh, the uh, seminar uh, today. Um, particularly uh, for uh, this seminar, uh, I asked and uh, finally succeeded in inviting uh, Professor Yoon, uh, who was my boss, and uh, I can say he is the most active former foreign minister we have ever had, and also he is one of the best and uh, most influential experts in Korea over North Korea uh, issue. Uh, and also I um, we acknowledge uh, the Dr. Van uh, Jackson from the Victoria University and uh, Deputy Secretary from MFET uh, for your uh, insight. And I hope uh, today's seminar will be an opportunity for all of you to uh, think about the Korean, uh, North Korean nuclear issue and particularly how to make it possible to resolve this issue in a diplomatic and a peaceful manner. Uh, as I said uh, in other occasions, um, our government strongly believes that uh, international support is crucial for our efforts to achieve nuclear-free, peaceful, and ultimately reunified Korea. Uh, I uh, hope and believe the support from the international community, including the new government of New Zealand, will continue and uh, will grow stronger. So lastly, I just remind you, uh, the reception will follow after uh, the main event Q&A session. I hope you enjoy that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador Yeo. Can I now um, introduce uh, Professor Yoon, Yoon Kwan. Uh, Professor Yoon is one of those rare beasts who, um, and privileged beasts in the, in the sense that he has not only been a, an academic for uh, uh, a long number of years, but he has also had the opportunity to serve his country as a minister. And he was Minister of Foreign Affairs and Trade of the Republic of Korea from 2003 to 2004. Uh, during his uh, academic career, he has taught uh, ex at uh, Seoul National University, one of the most uh, prominent universities in the Republic of Korea, and uh, I think we have a number of graduates of that university here today. It is also a partner university of Victoria.
Victoria University of Wellington, I'm pleased, I'm pleased to say, as well as, um, as well as teaching for a number of years at Seoul National University, uh, uh, Professor Ewan has also taught at the University of California, uh, Davis as well. He has published extensively on uh, international relations, political economy, particularly Korean foreign policy and inter-Korean inter relations. So can I ask you to join me in welcoming Professor Yoon. Thank you very much for your very generous uh, and kind introduction. And it is my great uh, privilege and pleasure uh, uh, to make a short presentation about the North Korean uh, pro nuclear program. And um, uh, New Zealand has been one of a few uh, favorite uh, countries of mine to visit. And uh, owing to kind uh, invitation by uh, Ambassador Yosun Bae, uh, I finally uh, could come uh, to uh, New Zealand and uh, my great uh, uh, privilege uh, uh, to talk about North Korean issue. Uh, we are far away from each other in terms of geography, but uh, both countries have been cooperating uh, since long time ago, at the time of a uh, Korean War, uh, New Zealand uh, dispatched uh, troops, and uh, we uh, benefited uh, much uh, from that kind of assistance from New Zealand uh, when we tried to develop democratic system and uh, economy in, in Korea. And uh, now, even nowadays, uh, bilateral relationship has been strengthening through conclusion of bilateral trade, uh, free trade agreement, uh, and uh, uh, bilateral cooperation on some other important issues. Uh, North Korean nuclear development uh, is a serious uh, problem uh, for Koreans as well as uh, uh, for the regions of Northeast Asia and global society as well. Um, North Koreans have been interested in nuclear development since long time ago, but it was around the beginning of 1990s uh, when the uh, Cold War uh, international order collapsed because of the collapse of the Soviet Union. At the time of great uh, transition of international order, North Korean leader Kim Il-sung decided to focus on uh, nuclear development instead of trying to reform its economy as all the other former uh, communist countries did. Uh, but the speed of uh, technological development uh, uh, in terms of nuclear and missile uh, development uh, by North Koreans uh, has been accelerating in the recent two years, uh, especially since the beginning of 1990, I mean 2016. Um, and if you look at this map, uh, this is uh, North Korea, and uh, this is a uh, northern missile uh, uh, range of, uh, I mean, Scud missile. And with the development of Scud missile, North Koreans could uh, attack uh, any uh, military base, American military bases inside South Korea. And uh, with uh, Rodong miss, Oops. Okay. Yeah, we, uh, uh, I'm lost. And uh, I'm not good at in high technology like this. <laughs> but anyway, with the development of uh, uh, Nodong missile, North Koreans could strike uh, at any American bases inside Japan. And later, 
they developed a uh, intermediate uh, intermediate uh, 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 intermediate uh, missiles IRBM with which they can strike Guam most important American military base in, in the Pacific. And finally, this July, uh, this July, uh, I mean, North Koreans could successfully launch two ICBMs with which they can strike uh, American mainland territory. And uh, this successful launching of uh, ICBM in July was a very important shock to American policymakers because they had been expecting that it would take three or four more years for North Koreans for North Koreans to complete ICBM technology and uh, uh, a miniaturization of nuclear warheads or deployment of uh, I mean, nuclear ICBMs in, inside North Korea. But uh, because of this successful launching of ICBM, uh, they changed it, uh, uh, their uh, evaluation of North Korean technology that it would take just uh, several months or one year uh, before they complete all these uh, technology technologies. And uh, the reason why North Korea wanted to develop uh, nuclear weapons, I think uh, uh, I can uh, classify two types of intention. One is defensive intention. First, they want to ensure regime survival. I mean, North Korean leader has been saying that he witnessed what happened uh, Saddam Hussein in Iraq and uh, Muhammad Gaddafi in Libya. Uh, he said that after giving up their nuclear options, I mean, uh, the regime change followed in both countries. So uh, the uh, uh, North Koreans wanted to develop nuclear weapons uh, as a way of uh, ensuring regime survival. And they also want to deter American intervention in a crisis situation in Korea. Uh, with short-range missiles like a Skirt or a Rodong, they thought they would be able to hit ports and air bases in South Korea and Japan to prevent massive flow of American reinforcements to the peninsula and uh, they thought they would be able to hit Guam with IRBM and uh, US mainland with ICBM. But there is another aggressive intention, I think, uh, and uh, they want to compel US to accept North Korea's nuclear status by threatening with nuclear and ICBMs. Uh, uh, they want uh, to become like Pakistan, for example. And uh, uh, if they are accepted by America and the international society as a de facto nuclear state, North Koreans are thinking that they would be able to uh, uh, achieve their own goal of reunification of Korea in line with their official doctrine. First, they want to conclude a peace treaty with the United States and uh, end so-called U.S. hostility. And also, they think that they will be able to make uh, U.S. to withdraw American troops from South Korea and uh, terminate the South Korea-U.S. alliance. And that will uh, open the opportunity to reunite Korea on their own terms. So uh, these are the North Korean intentions. But I think, uh, I think uh, there would be three kind of scenarios. One, military conflict scenario. The other is bargaining scenario. The, uh, the, uh, the last one will be 
uh, containment and deterrence scenario. Let me briefly explain each of them. First, a military conflict scenario. Uh, I think uh, U.S. has a, I mean, difficulty in executing a preemptive strike except in the case of imminent threat or a preventive war. And also North Korea knows that if they provoke and make war against South Korea or attacks American military facilities in South Korea or in Japan, that would mean the obliteration of their own regime. So I think the danger of uh, war uh, caused by aggressive uh, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, intention by each side will be probably relatively low. But I'm concerned about the possibility of unwanted accidental war caused by misperception, misjudgment, and, uh, I mean, uh, and uh, uh, war uh, caused by those uh, misperceptions and misjudgments. Uh, some historians like A.J.P. Taylor, uh, American uh, uh, and the British, uh, British uh, uh, historian mentioned that many European wars were started by a threatened power which had nothing to gain by war and much to lose. And uh, I mean, uh, so we had better worry about the possibility of unwanted accidental war caused by misperception and misjudgment. Judgment. And to avoid that kind of possibility, I think it is important for the American political leaders uh, to deliver a clear signal consistently that their goal is not regime change or preventive war, but policy change. In other words, denuclearization. But in the recent months, uh, signals coming from American government was a little bit confusing and contradicting each other. So I think it is better for them to try to calibrate the message they are sending to the North Korea carefully and uh, send a clear uh, signal uh, uh, consistently. And the, let me explain about the second scenario, bargaining scenario. Uh, again, uh, I think uh, we can classify uh, three kinds of bargaining scenario. One is President Trump's official position. He wants to pursue CVID, complete, verifiable, irreversible denuclearization. I think this would be most a desirable uh, result only if po it is possible. What I'm saying is uh, uh, to achieve this goal, China should cooperate uh, to full extent maximizing their sanction against North Korea so that uh, North Korean economy would be shaken seriously and North Korean people began to pressure their own leader politically. And uh, Kim Jong-un finally changed his strategic calculation to give up their nuclear option. I really don't know whether that kind of situation would easily come. Uh, because China has been regarding North Korea as a buffer state uh, in the last several uh, e decades. Uh, so more and more specialists in the United States began to talk about a less ambitious and more realistic option, that is freeze first and then denuclearize later. They argued that uh, Americans uh, should uh, aim at freezing North Korean nuclear missile program first in return for some compensation like uh, 
lifting of economic sanctions or some other uh, things. Uh, but I think this is a kind of realistic uh, goal. And the strength of this idea is that we can reduce the current tension to um, the maximum degree and we can open communication channels and it would be easier for us to mobilize a Chinese cooperation if we adopt this approach. But the weakness of this idea is that how much North Korea will cooperate in terms of inspection, we really do not know. And some people would criticize this idea as a de facto acceptance of North Korea as a nuclear uh, state. Uh, and another weakness is that uh, President Trump has been, I mean, uh, uh, Trump, uh, pre President Trump decertified Iranian style nuclear deal, even though his top steps eval uh, was, uh, uh, were evaluating that Iran was faithful to implementing, uh, implementing a nuclear uh, deal. So it's a kind of self-contradiction. On the one hand, uh, President Trump uh, decertifies Iran nuclear deal. On the other hand, uh, he pressures North Korea to come to the table uh, for a negotiated solution. So I think there should be some consistency between those two cases. Uh, finally, uh, some people are arguing for grand bargain, direct grand bargain between uh, the United States and China. People like uh, Halle Kissinger or Graham Allison of the Harvard University, something like uh, those people are arguing for direct uh, bargain between those two countries. And in return for Chinese cooperation, full cooperation in denuclearizing North Korea, Americans may provide some incentive uh, to China uh, on the issue of uh, uh, Korean Peninsula. They implied uh, something like uh, consideration of withdrawal of American troops or something like that. The uh, final scenario, third scenario is containment and deterrence. If international society fails to denuclearize North Korea after all, it will have to accept the reality and probably the United States uh, will not have any other option than uh, contain North Korea and deter North Korea as it did against Soviet Union uh, in the period of Cold War confrontation. So this is the third scenario. And I, I think that I mean, uh, a freeze idea is uh, probably the better uh, idea than the other uh, scenarios as of now because it can uh, provide more time uh, to solve uh, a North Korean nuclear problem uh, and uh, we never know what will happen uh, in terms of uh, domestic change inside North Korea. Uh, since mid-1990s, the nature of North Korean political economy and social system has been changing rapidly. And it may provide another opportunity for change uh, in terms of a uh, nuclear issue as well as uh, political change in the future uh, inside North Korea. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Yoon. I'd now like to introduce Dr. Van Jackson, who's the Defense and Security Fellow in the Center of Strategic Studies. He's also a senior lecturer in the international relations at Victoria University of Wellington. Uh, unlike our previous speaker, he hasn't been Secretary of State or Secretary of Defense. However, he has straddled three worlds and continues to do so. He has previously served in the Pentagon. He has also taught at a number of universities, uh, Georgetown, Hawaii Pacific, the Catholic University of America, as well as at the Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies. And he has been in the world of think tanks. Uh, he's currently, of course, affiliated to the Center of Strategic Studies. He's also had policy 
policy research appointments with the Center for a New American Security, the uh, Venerable Council on Foreign Relations, and the Pacific Forum of the Center of Strategic Studies and uh, uh, Strategic and International Studies. Uh, he is also the author of the book Rival Reputations, Coercion and Credibility in U.S.-North Korea Relations, so he is very well equipped to address today's topic. Can I ask you to join me in welcoming Van to the podium? Thanks, Rob. So uh, literally, as I was coming over here, I had a blue ink pen, and it exploded in my hands inexplicably. Uh, there's blue ink on my pants, on my hands, and I wasn't able to wash it off. So uh, first of all, if you see me afterwards, apologies in advance for being a little messy. Um, also, I hope it's not symbolic of events to come, the, ex the explosion of ink. So uh, I think everybody agrees that whether a diplomatic solution is possible depends very much on our goalposts, right? So how we define what we're trying to achieve with diplomacy. And what I want to do in my remarks briefly here is situate diplomacy and how we think about it in relation to uh, what we're trying to do with diplomacy. So before I answer the headline question for this event, uh, I want to try to paint a brief picture that gets us all on the same page, right? Imagine the United States flies nuclear-capable bombers up near the North Korean border, sporadically at first, then once per month, than twice per month. In parallel with the escalating bomber deployments, the United States starts sending nuclear-capable submarines to ports in South Korea. This means two-thirds of the American nuclear triad has a, nuclear, has a presence in South Korea. Then the United States issues warning orders to Navy surface ships patrolling in the seas off the eastern coast of North Korea. These warning orders program North Korean targets so that they can strike on command if asked. And these surface ships are equipped with Tomahawk land attack cruise missiles, the same kinds used against Syria in April, uh, again, without advanced warning. Then the US deploys fifth generation stealth fighters to Japan, Kadena Air Base, ideal for attacking ground targets in North Korea while evading North Korean air defenses. Then three aircraft carriers converge on the Pacific for the first time since 2007. Have you ever seen an aircraft carrier? It's the size of a city. Three of them, full up carrier strike groups. First time since 2007. Joint exercise. Then later on top of all of these military signals, Trump insulting Kim Jong-un at the UN. Trump threatening to quote, totally destroy North Korea at the UN. South Korea's military saying it's preparing to, quote, decapitate Kim Jong-un if necessary. They've got the plan for it. Do the math here. Add this up. What does this all look like to you? Right? Let's practice strategic empathy for a moment. If you're Kim Jong-un and you believe your nuclear arsenal is one of the reasons you haven't become Iraq or Libya, what are the odds you look at all this tough talk and military signals, and you say, gee, now's the perfect time for unilateral disarmament, right? Denuclearization sounds like a great idea right now. Obviously, I'm being facetious. Obviously, a rhetorical question. Who could possibly look at all of these things that we're doing in the name of maximum pressure and think that it's going to lead to the denuclearization of North Korea? And I, I paint this picture. I bring this stuff up because it illustrates a gratuitous mismatch between means and ends. If we want to evaluate whether maximum pressure, which is the course we are currently on, if we want to evaluate whether that's a sensible strategy, we have to ask maximum pressure for what, right? And Professor Yoon hit on this as well. Why does President Trump tell his own Secretary of State publicly, Rex Tillerson, Quote, you're wasting your time with diplomacy. This is not jujitsu. It's not reverse psychology. Trump wants unilateral disarmament of a nuclear armed adversary. Diplomacy will not achieve that. And I think even Trump realizes that, which is why he makes this comment and why he's doubled down on it and why he's tripled down on it. Only two weeks ago, 
National Security Advisor H.R. McMaster declared, again, publicly, the U.S. will accept nothing less than denuclearization. It's not interested even in deterrence. It's not interested in anything short of denuclearization, complete, verifiable, irreversible dismantlement of the nuclear program. He said also, two weeks ago, the U.S. is not even interested in talks unless there's a credible prospect of complete, verifiable, irreversible dismantlement of the nuclear program. And he says the window to resolve this current crisis short of military action is rapidly closing. Secretary of Defense Mattis was in Korea last week. He was less uh, inflammatory about the whole thing, but he articulated the same exact policy position. So by choice, we are opting in to the maximum pressure policy was the result of a comprehensive policy review done at the beginning of the Trump administration. We didn't end up here accidentally. This choice, this path, is creating increasing intense pressure, short time horizons, self-imposed, but short time horizons. Extremely high stakes, we're elevating the stakes even higher, and we're introducing lots of new opportunities for misperception and miscalculation, as Professor Yoon noted. Now, depending on what you're trying to achieve, that might make sense. Course of diplomacy, by definition, involves an element of manipulating risk. But in this case, right now, with North Korea, we're creating these risks for something that's not achievable. And that should concern everybody. So is a diplomatic solution possible? I say, not if a solution equals denuclearization. Denuclearization realistically requires war, and it's misleading or unfair to expect or claim otherwise. The US and North Korea have an irreducible conflict of interests as long as the United States retains the goal of denuclearization. And that's not me saying that. The United States and North Korea have repeatedly said that. That's why there are not negotiations right now, because as long as that's the US goal, there is an irreducible conflict of interests. Especially since Trump's speech at the UN in August. Since then, North Korea has come out multiple times confirming publicly that they have no interest in talks that tie in any way to disarmament that tie in any way to denuclearization. From the North Korea perspective, this is understandable, but for the strategic situation, this is kind of a problem, right? This is a showstopper. And nobody has put forward, not the administration, not any of its surrogates in the think tank world or elsewhere, nobody has put forward a theory of the case that's plausible that explains how denuclearization should result from a course of maximum pressure. Again, this should concern all of us. So what I'm saying here is that the traditional talking points on North Korea, which by and large have not changed for decades, they make us feel principled. Maximum pressure makes us feel good, maybe, like we're being responsive to the situation. But it's not going to lead us anywhere good. Now, if that sounds bleak, it's because it is, and it should be, and you should understand how terrible of a situation we're in in Korea right now. Um, but having said that, there is a lot of room for diplomacy. It just has to be done differently than how we've done it in the past, and it has to be done in service of something that's achievable and that serves the interests of opposing stakeholders. It can't be wholly lopsided, which is effectively what denuclearization is. And this is what I think current policy on North Korea tends to miss. The fact of nuclear armed missiles in North Korea changes what our primary interest is in North Korea. Human rights matter, proliferation matters, allies matter, allies matter a lot. But it's all less important than preventing an inadvertent nuclear war. And the prospects of that are real. It's higher than at any point since before the Cold War, or since during the Cold War. I can't think of anything worse than a nuclear war that nobody wants. That is a risk we should be managing. It should be our foremost priority. It should be an organizing principle of our policies. 
And if we do that, if we shift the goalposts from denuclearization to deterrence, strategic stability, crisis stability, recognizing what our real interests and our real priorities are, instead of inertia, instead of toughness. This has implications, it has ripple effects across the tools of statecraft, across the elements of uh, you know, national power, for the US and for the international community. Shifting the goalposts changes the content of what we do and how we do it, force posture, declaratory policy, extended deterrence and how we implement it, the role and limits of US nuclear weapons. Diplomacy is instrumental across all of these categories. And what you do and how you do it, what you're trying to do, it all depends on what you're aiming for. And as long as what you're aiming for is denuclearization, you're going to have distorted policy content across all of those areas. But if you shift the goalposts to something that's achievable and is actually your genuine new interest, right? Preventing inadvertent nuclear war wasn't an issue in North Korea 20 years ago because it didn't have nuclear weapons. Now it does. So now it is. When you shift the goalposts to that, suddenly diplomacy does have a chance to achieve something meaningful. In part because North Korea is interested also in avoiding a nuclear war. North Korea is also interested in nuclear safety. North Korea is also interested in stability. So uh, as I see it, and a, a growing number of others actually in the strategic studies community, Diplomacy in service of stability and conventional deterrence, um, this will actually help contain North Korea's nuclear arsenal. This will slow what is currently the unrestrained acceleration of North Korea's nuclear and missile arsenal. This will reduce opportunities for miscalculation. This is ultimately a pathway to arms control. And by virtue of engaging in this kind of process with North Korea, we end up reducing tensions on the peninsula. This, this is a way to actually have sustainable stability. Um, and if you want to know what the content of, is, of these things are, uh, we can address it in Q&A, or I've written extensively about this. Uh, it's Google Global. So this, to me, is totally sensible. It's totally doable. Why hasn't it happened before? Why do we still cling to this goal of denuclearization, which I've tried to make the claim is impossible. There are actually four reasons why, but I think all four have been overtaken by events. All four of these reasons why we still hold to denuclearization are not relevant anymore. First, until recently, denuclearization was possible. Right? Uh, we knew that realistically there was a point at which North Korea would no longer be denuclearizable. Its capability development would have gone too far. You can argue where the threshold is, right? A dozen warheads, the ability to miniaturize a nuclear warhead so that it fits on a missile. So there was some debate about where the threshold was. Now, there was a second debate about when they crossed the threshold, the point of no return for denuclearization. Some say as early as 2006, they've crossed that threshold. Uh, more realistically, it's like 2015 or so. But the point is that by the time the Trump administration came to office, everybody already thought the situation was too far gone for denuclearization. Nobody had an alternative strategy yet, but we knew that denuclearization was not realistic. Um, and I worked this issue in the Obama administration. I've sat at the table, literally, negotiating North Korea's nuclear program. I'm 100% certain, I can tell you with certainty, that most people at the time thought denuclearization of North Korea was possible until about like 2013 or so. And then in 2014, 2015, you start seeing the community of experts warning policymakers publicly and behind closed doors privately that the goal we've been clinging to for 25 years, denuclearization, was no longer doable. So one of the things that's fundamentally changed is the achievability of denuclearization. It's fine to aim for it when it's possible. CVID made sense at one point in time. It doesn't really make sense anymore. The second reason 
we uh, haven't pivoted away from denuclearization is because our allies, especially South Korea and Japan, should not have to live with a hostile nuclear neighbor. Um, a nuclear North Korea creates strategic problems in the region, um, but it also directly creates pressures for South Korea and Japan to go nuclear. Neither is there yet. They're not making a decision, right? They've just, South Korea just rejected that decision again. But it's happening in their discourse. This is a part of their political discourse now. So this is real. It has to end up in your political discourse before it ends up on the policy plate. The problem, though, is that they're already living with a nuclear North Korea. They're already living with a hostile nuclear neighbor. The rhetoric of denuclearization does nothing to remedy that. It does nothing to fix it. It actually exacerbates the problem because it short circuits diplomacy. As long as the goal is denuclearization, there's no room for diplomacy. That's why we don't have it right now. So I'm suggesting that instead of ignoring the world as it is, we deal with it. We do what we can to stabilize the current situation as best we can for as long as we can. The first step is requires moving away from denuclearization. That opens opportunities for diplomacy. And we shouldn't confuse our commitment to our alliances with a commitment to a goal of denuclearization. These things are not the same thing. The third reason we keep hanging on to denuclearization is because formal recognition of North Korea as a nuclear state would be damaging to the global nuclear non-proliferation norm, the nuclear taboo. And as I, I phrased that very carefully, as I phrased it, that is correct, right? But um, entering into talks to stabilize a nuclear crisis with North Korea or to reach a mutual understanding about limitations on capabilities and deterrence and stability. These things do not require political recognition of North Korea as a nuclear power. Nobody, nobody is talking about letting North Korea into the NPT as a nuclear state. That is recognition, in Jung-hara, right? That is not what anybody plans to do. It is simply about dealing with reality as it is which means coming off of a goal that can't happen and that actually antagonizes North Korea. And then fourth, finally, you know, historically, and this is partly our bad, partly North Korea's bad, um, we've had the wrong interlocutors, the wrong counterparts for nuclear diplomacy with North Korea historically. North Korea's foreign ministry handles all of their nuclear negotiations generally but they are not political insiders in the regime. They're outsiders within North Korea's decision-making circle, within the Kim regime. It was the same under his father, Kim Jong-il. And uh, I've talked to these guys before, their foreign ministry, our counterparts. They don't know anything about deterrence, escalation control, nuclear strategy, command and control. And these are the precise topics that we need to engage North Korea on if we want to stabilize the situation long term. So that's a problem. And even if the foreign ministry got smart on these issues, uh, it's not plausible that they would be empowered to negotiate away the equities of other stakeholders in their national security system, specifically in the military and in the nuclear industry, which is now a big part of their decision making processes. But North Korea gives us the foreign ministry to deal with, in part, because we give them the State Department. It, there's an element of mirror imaging happening here. But more important than that, the role of the foreign ministry in North Korean government life is to be the barbarian handlers. You're the group that keeps the outsiders at bay. You deal with the outside world so that regime elites, who actually do have power and influence, don't have to deal with the outside world. And this doesn't empower them within their own system. It just keeps us at arm's length. So if we want to have a knowledgeable, credible diplomacy um, along the lines that I'm thinking and we've written about before, we need to be talking to the military, to the National Defense Commission, to the Korean Workers' Party, 
people who have influence within the system and people who know about and deal with the issues that heretofore we have never discussed with them, but that we actually do need to discuss with them if the priority is no longer denuclearization, but actually a form of stability and eventually arms control. And there is actually, this takes a longer conversation, there is substantial evidence that North Korea would be interested in engaging on these topics with the counterparts that I've suggested. Again, it's a longer conversation. So I'm over time. Just to sum up, uh, a policy of maximum pressure is going nowhere fast, at least nowhere good. And I'm not saying North Korea is not the bad guy. They are the bad guy. Don't get it twisted. Uh, but the current crisis is one largely of our own making. North Korea has been remarkably transparent and predictable about its intentions. We are the ones embracing maximum pressure, which brings with it the possibility of nuclear war, and we're doing it without any obvious upside, right? It's all because we're pursuing a goal that experts deem unachievable. We are tilting at nuclear windmills. So for diplomacy to have a chance, it needs to be in service of something realistic and mutually beneficial. Denuclearization is neither of those things. And until we recognize that, it's gonna be very hard to have a serious discussion about an alternative, more stable future for the Korean Peninsula. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Van. I was heartened to see that your pen didn't explode again, so perhaps that's a promising sign. <laughs> Can I now introduce uh, Ben King, who is Deputy Secretary of the Americas and Asia Group in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Uh, ben has had uh, an extensive career in the, in the uh, New Zealand Diplomatic Service. He has recently returned from Bangkok, where he was New Zealand Ambassador to Thailand, Cambodia, and Lao PDR. He has also served as Foreign Policy Advisor to the Prime Minister of, uh, of New Zealand and has had a number, number of other postings. He, has, uh, he was educated at the University of Waikato and the Kennedy School of Harvard University. Can I ask you now to join me in welcoming the final of our speakers who's going to present a New Zealand perspective on this issue. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Yoon, uh, Your Excellency Ambassador Yeo, uh, Rob Rebell and staff at the University, Excellencies, distinguished guests and ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for the invitation to speak here today. It's my great honour to welcome to Wellington Professor Yoon. I'm glad we had an opportunity to finally work out how to get you here and thank you very much for the remarks uh, that you made today. Also like to thank uh, Dr Jackson for sharing his views um, and uh, provocative ideas about um, how we should look at this um, situation. Before I start my formal remarks I need to uh, put down some caveats around my comments today. As you know the New Zealand government was sworn in eight days ago and we now have a new foreign minister, the Right Honourable Winston Peters. Minister Peters was of course our Minister of Foreign Affairs from 2005 to 2008. I've not yet had an opportunity to discuss the direction of North Korean policy with Minister Peters and the direction he wishes to take. So I'll therefore ask for your understanding that my comments today and my answers to questions will necessarily be cautious and focused on the principles that successive New, Ze the New Zealand governments have applied in their approach to North Korea. These principles include a commitment to the rule of law, a preference to work through multilateral organisations, a commitment to nuclear non-proliferation and a desire for a stable, secure and prosperous Asia-Pacific region. It's possibly most useful in remarks of this nature to remind ourselves why New Zealand dedicates a significant amount of resource to the challenges posed by North Korea. And the reasons are clear. They're rooted in our history, including the commitment of New Zealand troops in the Korean War. Over time, as our relationships in North, Korea have, in North Asia have matured, so too have the depth and complexity of our interests. New Zealand's present and future security and prosperity are inextricably linked to Asia. We cannot, should not, and will not stand by if a country acts in ways which defy UN Security Council resolutions and directly threaten the peace and stability of the Asia-Pacific region. 
My remarks today will explore these issues in more detail and outline a number of reasons why what happens in North Korea matters a great deal here in New Zealand. Let's start with the history, which takes us back to 1950 when the Korean War broke out. New Zealand was one of the first countries to answer the United Nations call to send troops to support South Korea. Over 6,000 New Zealand Defence Force personnel were deployed to Korea during the war and 45 gave their lives on operational service. Back in 1950, New Zealand did not have a diplomatic relationship with South Korea, nor trade linkages. Many of the service people getting on the boats hardly knew where Korea was. Yet New Zealand made a significant contribution to the Korean War. Why? Because New Zealand was and continues to be a responsible global citizen. Because the United Nations called for international contributions. And because we as a small country were a firm believer in the importance of the international rules-based order. These factors remain central drivers of New Zealand foreign policy and ensure that North Korea remains an issue for us. North Korea's nuclear and weapons program directly contravenes our effort to work to promote global respect for international rules and norms. During our time on the United Nations Security Council, we worked with other council members condemning North Korea's breaches of UN resolutions and strengthening the international legal regime around North Korea. I expect New Zealand will continue to condemn North Korea's actions where they are inconsistent with international law and call on Pyongyang to return to compliance with the international obligations that the Security Council has required of it and commit to complete verifiable and irreversible denuclearization of North Korea. Secondly, the threats posed by North Korea's nuclear and missile programs are truly global in nature. North Korea has publicly threatened Australia and threatened to carry out atmospheric nuclear tests over the Pacific Ocean. That brings the danger very close to home. And let me say how unthinkable it is in the 21st century to have any country talking openly about the possibility of atmospheric nuclear testing. Thirdly, we absolutely reject nuclear weapons and the testing of those weapons. New Zealand continues to play an active role in global efforts to control nuclear proliferation. Most recently in September this year, New Zealand signed the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, a very clear signal to the world that we consider the possession and use of nuclear weapons to be unacceptable. We are also interested in North Korea because of its appalling human rights record. And I'd like to quote here Minister Peter's intervention at an APEC meeting in 2006. He said, as North Korea heads into winter, our thoughts go out to its people who must endure another harsh season of famine and want while their leaders yet again disregard their welfare in favour of their own self-interest and survival. Sadly, this statement remains true some 11 years later. Let us not forget that the biggest victims of North Korea's current approach are its own people. New Zealand has, over a number of years, co-sponsored UN Human Rights Council and General Assembly resolutions condemning North Korea's abuse of human rights. Again, during our Security Council term, we supported the issue being on the Council's agenda as a significant threat to international peace and security. New Zealand's history of involvement in the Korean Peninsula continues to play a significant part in our modern-day interest in the North Korea situation. To this day, we retain an active New Zealand Defence Force presence in Korea. Needless to say, New Zealand has a vested interest in ensuring the armistice holds and that we do not see another conflict in our region. Finally, this issue is not only relevant to New Zealand's safety and security, it is also critical to our prosperity. Instability on the Korean Peninsula would have a significant flow-on effects for all of North Asia. Financial markets, tourism and trade flows are all sensitive to perceptions of stability across the globe. If Asian economies slow or are disrupted, New Zealand's economy would in turn feel the effect. Now that I've discussed why New Zealand takes a close interest in developments involving North Korea, let me set out what it is that New Zealand is calling on North Korea to do. New Zealand has consistently, through successive governments, 
called for North Korea to cease all nuclear and missile testing and development. We also call for the situation to be resolved peacefully. Our hope is that North Korea will eventually see that the capability which it is developing to enhance its security is in fact the very thing that is threatening its security and that of the region. Rejoining the international community and complying with international norms is Pyongyang's best pathway to a stable and secure future. We want to see meaningful dialogue and engagement resume with the goal of negotiating the eventual denuclearisation of North Korea. I want to be clear that New Zealand's view is that there is a pathway open to North Korea, a pathway of denuclearisation and peaceful coexistence with its neighbours and the wider region. Again, I'd like to quote Mr Peters here following his visit to Pyongyang in 2007 when he said, if North Korea continues to cooperate and implement its undertakings to denuclearise, New Zealand is ready to develop the relationship. In today's context, should North Korea embark on a process of denuclearisation and meaningful engagement with other members and the international community, we can be confident that New Zealand would be among the first to step up and provide assistance. In current circumstances, it is difficult to see how we can get from where we are now to a peaceful, stable, prosperous and nuclear-free Korea. This is an area where I have to adopt an abundance of caution, given that New Zealand's approach to North Korean policy will be determined by our new government. As such, I'll fall back on the safety of key principles which have guided New Zealand's response to North Korea's nuclear and missile programs over successive governments.